This presentation, we are going to focus on Matthew chapter 14 and a couple of things that he teaches in the, the Savior teaches in Matthew 14, and then John chapters 5 through 7. As always, if you're listening to this in podcast form where it's audio only, you need to know that I do this for my YouTube channel and I have slides that go along with the presentation. So if you ever want to see them, you can go to my YouTube channel titled Coming Under Christ or Looking Under Michael S. Clough. And you can see the slides, the quotes, and the different charts I have that I may refer to in this presentation. So with that, let's go to Matthew chapter 14, verses 15 through 21. This is a well-known story where Jesus feeds the 5,000. What I don't want to do is just take a look at two things in this that we learn from this story that is easily missed. First of all is verse 19. It says, And he, meaning Christ, commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass, and he took the five loaves and the two fishes. And looking up to heaven, he blessed and brake. Now notice the process or the, the way that he now goes to give to the people. And he gave the loaves to his disciples, so the twelve apostles, and the disciples then gave to the multitude. That is the pattern in the church. We will receive revelation for this church in that pattern. Christ will give to his apostles and first presidency, which are also apostles, he will give to his apostles first, and then they will give to the church or to the multitude. So in the feeding of the 5,000, we see the pattern Christ uses in his church in guiding and leading and directing it. And they did all eat and were filled, and they took up the fragments that remained 12 baskets full. That's verse 20. I included that because I wanted to show that how they had all of this food that was left over. In other words, Christ is inexhaustible. His power, his might, his dominion, his character, it is never going to run out. Christ is inexhaustible. We can count on him. We can trust him. We can put our faith in him. Let's now go to Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 36. This is the famous story of when Jesus was walking on the water. I want to show that this story has symbolic elements in it that is symbolic of our fallen condition and Christ overcoming the world, that he is above all things. And because Christ has overcome the world, that he is above all things, he can help and overcome our fallen condition based upon our use of agency and the gift of repentance, if we decide to use that or not. So let's take a look at how this story reflects, its, in symbolism, our fallen condition in Christ having the ability to overcome it. So we'll take start with Matthew 14, 22 through 36. Verse 22, And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him on the other side, while he sent the multitude away. So this is after the feeding of the 5,000. Verse 23, And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray when the evening was come. He was there alone. And so he sends the apostles to go on the Sea of Galilee to cross over. And he stays up the mountain to pray, to receive direction from his Father in heaven. Boy, how much more do we need to pray if the Savior had need to pray? And so he is alone now in that condition as his apostles are trying to cross the Sea of Galilee. Now in this same story as recorded in Mark chapter 6, Verses 47 through 48, Mark adds this detail that is not in Matthew. Mark says, And when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. So we get the hint of that in Matthew, but then he adds this in 48, Mark. 
And he, Christ, saw them toiling in rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. I like this addition that Mark gives us that's not in Matthew. Christ, after praying, goes and looks out over the Sea of Galilee, and he sees them rowing against this storm, and they're not getting anywhere, and they're trying so hard. And so here they are in the midst of this affliction, and Christ sees them. Brothers and sisters, Christ sees our afflictions. He sees when we're hurting. He sees when we're rowing against the wind. He sees our storms. He is aware of them. Notice right at this point, he doesn't take it all away from them. Even though he sees it, he lets them contend with the things that they're meant to contend with down here in mortality. Now, back to Matthew 14, verse 24. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. Isn't that symbolically a good description of mortality? Have you ever felt tossed with the waves and going contrary to the wind? Do you feel like sometimes you're about ready to sink? Take a look in the wording and some other scriptures in the Book of Mormon and how they have some of this same wording as the ship being tossed with waves. And here they are in the midst of this, just trying to row and get to the other side. This is our endless condition if there was no atonement. If there was no atonement made, brothers and sisters, we would constantly be in a mortal world tossed with waves and rowing contrary to the wind. We would be in our storms and have no help. This is a good description of our mortal condition if there's no atonement. Look at Alma. Alma, after teaching that all things shall be restored, good for good and evil for evil, and how those who desire righteousness will be rewarded unto righteousness, then he says, this is Alma 41, 7, These are they that are redeemed of the Lord. These are they that are taken out, that are delivered from that endless night of darkness. See? This was at night they were rowing. We would be an endless night of darkness down here, brothers and sisters, if it was not for Jesus Christ. They are delivered from that endless night of darkness, and thus they stand or fall. For behold, they are their own judges, whether to do good or to do evil. We can be delivered from this endless night of darkness called mortality in our fallen nature if we decide to come unto Christ and follow him. Take a look at Mormon, chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. Notice the wording in this one that is like the apostles at night rowing in the wind and they're contrary and they can't get anywhere and they're trying so hard. Verse 16, For behold, the Spirit of the Lord hath already ceased to strive with their fathers, and they are without Christ and God in the world, and they are driven about as chaff before the wind. Isn't that the same as this story? These apostles in this boat are being driven as chaff before the wind in this sea, and they can't get anywhere. On our own, brothers and sisters, we cannot make it back to our Father in heaven. Mortality becomes over extremely overwhelming. Verse 18, But now, behold, they are led about by Satan, even as chaff is driven before the wind, or as a vessel is tossed upon the waves, without sail or anchor, without anything wherein to steer her, and even as she is, so are they. This is the same as that boat. Brothers and sisters, without Christ, we would be driven by Satan, like a vessel is by the wind, and tossed about by waves in a storm. Take a look at Alma 26, 14 through 15. Look at the wording and how it is very similar to the wording in this story of the apostles on the Sea of Galilee. Verse 14, Yea, we have reason to praise him forever, for he is the Most High God and has loosed our brethren from the chains of hell. Yea, verse 15, Yea, they were encircled about with an everlasting darkness 
and destruction. Isn't that a good description of these apostles in the boat in the sea? They were encircled about with an everlasting darkness and destruction upon this sea in the middle of the night. Back to Alma, and behold, he has brought them unto his everlasting light, yea, and to everlasting salvation. And they are encircled about with the malchus bounty of his love. Yea, and we have been instruments in his hands of doing this great and marvelous work. Because of Christ and his atonement, we can be brought into an everlasting light. But notice, without Christ in the boat, without Christ with them, look how they're struggling on the sea. Look how we struggle in mortality without Jesus Christ. Now, back to the story, Matthew 14, verse 24. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. He knows our situation. He sees their peril. Why does he decide to walk on the sea? That would mean everything on this earth is underneath his feet, isn't it? See the symbolism there? All things in this world are now under him. He has risen above all things. Therefore, Christ has power over all things on this world. Notice how this is taught in 1 Corinthians verse 15, 25, or chapter 15, verse 25 through 27. It says, verse 25, For he must reign, Christ, till he hath put all enemies under his feet. Verse 26, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Verse 27, for he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. See, there's the teaching. This is symbolic of Christ, how he will, through his atonement, put all things under him. He will be above all things. Therefore, he can help us in this world with all things. Notice the same thing is taught in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 20 through 22. Verse 20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Verse 21, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Verse 22, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. So symbolically in the story, Christ walking on the water, everything in the world now is under him. He is above all things. Back to the story in Matthew 14, verse 26. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. Sometimes we don't always recognize the Savior in our life and we need help. Or sometimes our fear can overcome us. Verse 27, But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. Why should we not be afraid, brothers and sisters? If Christ is with us, he has power above all things. He has overcome the world. Therefore, he can help us if we'll just turn our hearts to him. Now, that doesn't mean he takes everything away from us. Don't, don't get this wrong. It means that he'll help us get through things. He will help us as we struggle in rowing our own boats in our own seas that are turbulent. But he can help us and strengthen us in that. Sometimes he will take the storms away. Other times he helps us row through the storms. Verse 28, And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, if it's according to your will, bid me come unto thee on the water. Peter now wants to come unto Christ. Do we want to come unto him? Do we just want to be with him? Verse 29, And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Oh, the things we can do, brothers and sisters, if we'll just focus on the Savior. When you go to church, don't focus on the members and their 
weaknesses and that we all have them. We're imperfect in the church. Then you're just going to come away with, God, things are imperfect and this person judges and there's this hypocrite. And that. No kidding. We're all that way. No, we go to focus on the Savior. If you focus on him, then you won't notice all the other stuff and it will not bother you. That I know to be true. Verse 30, but when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink. And he cried, saying, Lord, save me. Do you see the pattern here? Do you see the symbolism? If you and I focus on other people, if we focus on the waves in the sea, if we just focus on the distraught in our lives, if that's where our focus is, then we do sink. We start to sink. It overwhelms us. It overcomes us. Peter took his eye off the Savior. Brothers and sisters, I know of what I speak. I have had times in my life where I have felt so much darkness that I thought there was no way out. I have felt overcome by such grips of fear because of mental illness that I didn't think that I could get out of it, that I was abandoned. And if I would have stayed focused on that fear or that darkness, then it would engulf me. But as I focus on the Savior and turn my heart over to Him, He helps me through those things and helps me find the needed help I need to help me with my mental condition, illness condition that causes some of those things. And where man can't help, then the Lord helps me. And so by focusing on him, I'm able to manage my mental illness and to not let it overcome me as Peter is overcome and affront. What is your my focus on? See, that's important. We have got to focus on Christ down here or we will become overwhelmed so quickly. This is reminiscent of James chapter 1, verse 6. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. See, Peter started looking at the waves and he started to waver. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Isn't that the same of the same wording as what Peter is going through? We need to focus on the Savior, having faith in him, nothing waver, not waver. Continue to focus on Christ, no matter how bad it gets. I will follow you, Christ. I will always be true to you in the covenants that I have made. Now think of Alma 36, 70, I'm sorry, that should be 17 through 18. I've got a problem on the slide there, sorry for that. Not catching that. Alma 36, 17 through 18. Look what Alma says. And it came to pass, as I was thus racked with torment. Remember, this is when he was being tormented because of his sins and persecuting the church. While I was harrowed up by the memory of my many sins. This is when the angel came and he has passed out. I Behold, I remembered also to have heard my father prophesy unto this people concerning the coming of one Jesus Christ, a son of God, to atone for the sins of the world. Now verse 13. Now as my mind caught hold upon this thought, I cried within my heart, O Jesus, thou son of God, have mercy on me. He said, I remembered Christ, and I all of a sudden turned my focus. I focused my energy, my attention. I focused my desires. I focused my faith on Jesus Christ. And what happens to Alma? Have mercy on me, who am in the gall of bitterness, and encircle me about by the everlasting chains of death. And remember, he receives strength and is able to repent of what he has done and overcome his challenges. Peter is learning that this is what you have to do. You cannot focus on the waves and the storms of our lives. We have to put our focus and faith in Jesus Christ. Now back to Matthew chapter 14, verse 31. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? O Peter, Next time, just focus and keep your focus on me. 
and don't doubt that I can help you through the storms of your lives. This is, reminds me of the example of 2 Nephi chapter 4, verses 31 through 35 of the faith Nephi had. This is what Trice is trying to teach Peter. Listen to what Nephi says in chapter 4, verse 31. O Lord, wilt thou redeem my soul? Wilt thou deliver me out of the hands of my enemies? Wilt thou make me that I may shake at the appearance of sin? Verse 32, may the gates of hell be shut continually before me because that my heart is broken and my spirit is contrite. O Lord, wilt thou not shut the gates of thy righteousness before me that I may walk in the path of the low valley, that I may be strict in the plain road. See how he's just pleading, just help me to focus on thee. Help me to have a broken heart and a contrite spirit continually, to continually look into thee. Verse 33, O Lord, wilt thou encircle me about in the robe of thy righteousness? O Lord, wilt thou make me a way for mine escape before mine enemies? Wilt thou make my path straight before me? Wilt thou not place a stumbling block in my way, but that thou wouldest clear my way before me and hedge not up my way, but the ways of mine enemies? And then verse 34, O Lord, I have trusted in thee, and I will trust in thee forever. I will not put my trust in the arm of flesh, for I know that cursed is he that putteth his trust in the arm of flesh. Yea, cursed is he that putteth his trust in man, or maketh his arm of flesh. Lord, I will only trust in you, is what he's saying. I will only focus on you. And then verse 35, Yea, I know that God will give liberally to him that asketh. Yea, my God will give me if I ask not amiss. Therefore, I will lift up my voice unto thee. Yea, I will cry unto thee, my God, the rock of my righteousness. Behold, my voice shall forever ascend up unto thee, my rock and mine everlasting God. That's the trust and the faith that we should put in the great Jehovah in Jesus Christ. Nephi gives an example. Peter is learning how to be like this. We need to learn how to be like this. Now back to Matthew chapter 14, verse 32. And when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. Now Christ is with them, brothers and sisters. When Christ is in our lives, we can feel peace, even in the midst of all things coming loose. That I know to be true. I can be at peace even though things around me and things in my life are possibly falling apart. If Christ is in my life with me, the wind ceased. This is reminiscent of Isaiah 54, 11 through 13. See, with the atonement, we can have the winds of our mortality, the winds of the natural man cease we can find peace through repentance because of the atonement. Isaiah 54, 11 and 13, verse 11. O thou toss, afflicted, tossed with tempest. What, doesn't that sound very familiar? That's very similar to this story, isn't it? And not comforted. Behold, I will lay thy stones with fair colors and lay thy foundation with sapphires. Verse 13. And all thy children shall be taught of the Lord. And great shall be the peace of thy children. What greater peace is there to know that because of the atonement of Jesus Christ, we can return to the Father. That's the kind of peace we're talking about. The peace from guilt. The peace of conscience knowing that we are bound to Christ through covenants and that we're on his road, the good covenant path of the gospel. Now Matthew 14, verse 33. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying of a truth, Thou art the Son of God. See how this whole story is? First, our fallen condition. We live in a mortal world. We are fallen and tossed to and fro upon a sea. Two, Christ will, has come and has overcome the world as everything is under his feet. And if we will now accept him and accept him in our lives and focus on him, then and worship him and know that he is the son of God and keep our covenants, 
then we can have the storms that are brought about because of sin and the natural man. We can have those calmed and guilt can be swept away. Now with the restoration, now that they are restored and they are at peace and they're back in the boat, the people now notice the story coming to Christ and can and be healed. Matthew 13, 34, and when they were gone over, they came into the land of Gennesaret. Verse 35, and when the men of that place had knowledge of him, they sent out into all the country round about and brought unto him all that were diseased. Verse 36, and they besought him that they might only touch the hem of his garment, and as many as touched were made perfectly whole. So this story is very symbolic of us in our fallen condition. We are tossed to and fro in mortality. But because of Christ overcoming, walking on the sea, overcoming, and having the world beneath him through the atonement, he then can bring peace to our hearts through repentance. And as we strive to have a broken heart and a contrite spirit, then we can be healed of the natural man. What a beautiful story and such beautiful symbolism. Well, let's now turn our attention to John chapters 5, 6, and 7. I'm going to do something. I have a chart for those who are listening only through audio format. I have a chart that I'm showing that has three columns. The first column is John chapter 5. The second column is John chapter 6, and then the third column is John chapter 7. So those who are listening just with audio format, if you can kind of picture that. And then down in each column, I'm going to go through each chapter of some things and show you this repetition that is in each chapter and what maybe John is trying to teach us what is going on. First of all, in John chapter 5, verse 1, if you look at note footnote 8, that this is most likely the Feast of Purim. That is when they celebrated Esther. Remember when she went into the king and saved the Jewish people because of her courage? This is the Feast of Purim that has to do with life and saving life. Well, first of all, let's see a miracle Christ performs. John chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. Christ heals the impotent man at the pool of Bethesda on the Sabbath day. So as you read verses 1 through 9, remember the man has no way to go into the watering where they feel when it is, trub when it is troubled, when they see uh, the water moving, that they, they felt that was an angel there and the first one in gets healed. That was a part of their mythology that they had. And there was no one to help this man. He was impotent. He couldn't move. Well, Christ heals him. He shows that, no, it's not the water that heals you. It's me. I am the living water that can heal you. Now, in John chapter 5, verse 10, here is the reaction of the Pharisees and scribes and some of the people. The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, It is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. Isn't that amazing? Christ has just performed a wonderful, beautiful miracle, and all they focus on is the physical bed this man picks up and walks, and that how he broke the Sabbath day, because he's carrying a bed on the Sabbath. They chose to f focus on that physical part, and that's it. They missed the whole spiritual thing of this healing. And then now the Savior makes a declaration in John 5, 17 and 19 through 26. Jesus declares that as his son, that as he, his son, he does the work, as his son, he does the work of the father. As the father has life in himself, so does the son. So reaffirms, no, we didn't break the Sabbath. They didn't just see a miracle. This testifies that I am the son of the father. I do his work. His fruits are seen in my works. And my life declares, though, that I am his son. What is the reaction? John 5, verse 18, the reaction to that declaration Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was, with, was his father, making himself equal with God. Isn't that incredible? They now want to kill him. Well, the fruits of the things he does testifies that he is the Son of God. But all they did was focus on him 
supposedly in their minds, break the Sabbath. And the man carrying his bed, they miss the spirit of the whole thing. It goes right over their heads. Now let's turn, take a look at John chapter 6. This same pattern is repeated. In John chapter 6, verse 4, we learn that this is now the time of the Passover, which also is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. They both go together. And so during the Passover, this time of Passover and Unleavened Bread, in John chapter 6, verses 5 through 14, Christ performs a miracle. Again, what is the miracle? Jesus fed the multitude of 5,000 with five barley loaves of bread and two small fishes. See, notice how the miracle fits the feast. In the first one was Purim, that of celebrating life. Esther gave life to the Jewish people because she went into the king. And Christ gives life back to the impotent man. Now notice this one. It's the Passover and unleavened bread. Christ takes five loaves of bread and feeds 5,000 people. Well, what is their reaction? In John chapter 6, verse 15, and then 25 through 31, the reaction is the people sought to make Jesus a king. They wanted him to now rule over them and to get rid. He had power to get rid of the Romans. The next day they sought Jesus, not to be taught and keep his sayings, but to be fed again. They just focused on the physical food. They missed the whole point of the miracle and who he was, that he is the real bread of life. But they just came to be fed again. They sought a sign. Jesus had only fed them once. Their fathers ate manna miraculously for 40 years. Among the Jewish people, there was a tradition that the one month the Messiah came, he would repeat the miracle of manna coming from heaven. And so that's what they're expecting, this physical manna to show up. Look, if you're really the Messiah, then you should do the same miracle as you did for our forefathers. Well, what's the declaration he makes to them after their reaction? In John chapter 6, verses 32 through 35, and verse 49, he makes the declaration, I am the bread of life. He that came to me shall never hunger. And then he tells him, your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness, and they are dead. I can give you eternal bread that will give you eternal life. I'm not here just to feed you physically, spiritually. I am that bread. That manna represented me, and he declares that. Well, what's their reaction as he makes that declaration? John chapter 6, verses 41 through 42. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? This is the son of Joseph and Mary. No, he's the son of Mary and of Elohim, God. And they missed it. Again, they just focused on the physical and they missed the whole spiritual aspect of everything. Now let's turn our attention to John chapter 7. Notice the same pattern is going to be repeated. This time in John chapter 7 verse 2, this is the Feast of Tabernacles. And they would go on the Feast of Tabernacles, and during one part of the Feast of Tabernacles, the priest would get water from the pool of Shiloh or Shiloam, and they would take it and pour it on the altar in the temple, which would be symbolic of giving, getting the Spirit, the Holy Ghost, living water to guide and direct them. Well, look at the miracle Christ performs in John chapter 7, verse 14. Now, about the midst of the feast, or during the middle of the feast, Jesus went into the temple and taught. Now, at least you make the mistake and think that is not a miracle. Think again. It is a miracle that a God came down and took upon him the form of man and is now willing to teach the people. Christ willingly condescended and was willing to now teach. That is a miracle. Well, look at their reaction. Instead of sitting there and seeking to fill the Spirit and to be moved and to be touched by the Spirit and to receive spiritual food, John 7, verse 15, the reaction of the Pharisees was this. And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? 
He was never in our rabbinical school. We didn't see him sit with the great rabbis. He didn't go to our colleges. He never had letters. That means going to school. We never saw him. How does he teach all the... All they focus was that he never went to the schools of the rabbis. And he didn't get taught by them. And they're missing the whole point of his teachings and being taught by the Spirit. Well, John 7, verse 16, and then verses 37 to 39, Christ then makes this declaration after that reaction. My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man thirst, let him come unto me. If they would believe on him, then their bellies would flow would f- would flow rivers of living water, referring to the promise of the Holy Ghost unto the believing. Can't you see him saying this and saying, I am the living waters, that that priest is pouring water on the altar as a part of this feast? Can't you see the Savior then standing up and saying, that is me, I am that living water that you have been pouring on this altar over and over every year during this celebration. I have finally come. Believe in me. I will give you through the Spirit living water. Well, what's their reaction after he makes that declaration? The people were divided. Some declared he was the Christ. Others doubted because he came out of Galilee. They just focused on physically where they thought he was born. He wasn't born there, but he did live and grow up there. And that bothered them because they focused on that. Not on the spiritual thing of him being the son of God. Do you see a pattern here? A miracle. They missed the miracle and the spirit of it. He declares then who he is and they react to it because all they focus is on the physical. Notice how that is repeated in these three chapters. Well, what was their focus and Jesus' warning? Their focus was on physical things, the things of a physical nature. Therefore, they missed the whole spiritual aspect. John 5, verse 39, he says, Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life. See, the scribes and Pharisees were teaching the people that if you just study the scriptures, in the scriptures and in the law of Moses is eternal life. Well, that would mean there's no need for a Savior. This is why they're butting heads so much. Christ is saying, no, in the scriptures, they are they which testify of me. Search them. The law of Moses was about me. The law can't save you. The scriptures in themselves can't save you. Brothers and sisters, the gospel today can't save us. Going to the temple can't save us. We do things. We do ordinance. Yes, that's important. But that in and of itself cannot save us. It is only Jesus Christ. We have to focus again on him. They were not focusing on him. They were not focusing on things of the Spirit. Look what John chapter 6, verse 63 says. It is the Spirit that quickeneth. See, he's even pointing this now out to them. The flesh profiteth nothing. Quit focusing on things of mortal flesh. It's the Spirit that's going to save you. The Spirit that I have that I can bring you and the Holy Ghost will give you if you'll just come unto me. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit. They are life. And so he's trying to point out, quit focusing on the physical things of mortality. You must have the Spirit. Brothers and sisters, if we do not get the Spirit and focus on the spiritual things in our lives, then we cannot return unto him. We will not stay on the covenant path. We won't even recognize the covenant path if we do not focus on spiritual things. Now, Melvin J. Ballard, the grandfather of Elder Ballard today, said this concerning how Satan will tempt us. So far as the Latter-day Saints are concerned, we never conceived that the devil was a monstrosity, that he had long horns and a tail and forked hooves. No, sir, he is a gentleman in outward appearance, and if you were to see him, you would turn around to look at him. He is more knowledgeable than we are. He is a reality. I am as sure as that as has, that he has a personality. I am as sure that he lives that I am that God lives. 
Although he may seek to deceive men and to persuade them that he does not exist, he does exist, and he never was so active as he is today. This is said in 1928. Think what he would say today. In the meantime, what is his business today? I declare unto you that he has his recruiting stations everywhere in the world, and they are armed. He has soldiers, and he has plenty of them. Now look how Satan will seek to capture us. I should like to say to you, my brothers and sisters, that all the assaults that the enemy of our soul will make to capture us will be through the flesh because it is made up of the unredeemed earth, and he has power over the elements of the earth. The approach he makes to us will be through the lusts, the appetites, the ambitions of the flesh. All the help that comes to us from the Lord to aid us in this struggle will come to us through the spirit that dwells within this mortal body. Do you see why if we focus on the things of the flesh, the lust of the flesh, the appetites of the flesh, the ambitions of the flesh, that it will destroy us? Christ gets us to focus on mortality and the things of the flesh. The only way we will overcome that, that war with the adversary, with Satan, is that we must do it through the Spirit. That's why he gives us the gift of the Holy Ghost at age 8 so that we can learn to rely upon the Spirit. Without that, we would be doomed. How well are we focusing upon spiritual things? It is key. It is central. That's why the prophets encourage us to study scriptures daily, to pray daily, to fast once a month, brothers and sisters. It gets us to focus upon things of the Spirit, of a spiritual nature. Well, how to come unto Christ and focus on him now is taught in these chapters. John chapter 5, verses 40 through 47, Christ then gives a great discourse where he says, Believe his prophets. It says, verse 40, And ye will not come unto me, and ye will not come unto me that you might have life. 41, I receive not honor from men, but I know that ye have not the love of God in you. I am come into the, my Father's name, and you receive not me, me not. If another shall come in his own name, will you receive him? Verse 44, how can you believe which receive honor one of another, and seek not honor that come from God only? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom you trust. For had you believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. You see what he's saying? If you truly believe the prophecies of Moses and you believe that he was a true prophet, then you would have turned unto me. Because Moses only testified of the Messiah. They didn't really believe in the prophet. Verse 47, but if ye believe not his writings... How shall you believe my words? They were just going a surface level of following Moses and the law and thinking that the law would save them. They didn't truly believe in Moses and his prophecies of the Messiah, or they would have recognized Jesus when he came. So one, brothers and sisters, how we come unto Christ and focus on him is that we believe in his prophets and sustain and support them. Another, Neil A. Maxwell said, Our relationship to living prophets is not one in which their sayings are a smorgasbord from which we may take only that which pleases us. We are to partake of all that is placed before us, including the spinach, and to leave a clean plate. Prophets don't teach things and we just pick and choose. They are to teach things for the church that are necessary to guide and direct the church. Neil A. Maxwell said on another occasion, President Marion G. Romney said many years ago that he had never hesitated to follow the counsel of the authorities of the church, even though it crossed my social, professional, or political life. This is a hard doctrine. It is a particular vital doctrine in a society which is becoming more wicked. 
In short, brothers and sisters, not being ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ includes not being ashamed of the prophets of Jesus Christ. You cannot have one without the other. Well, John chapter 6, verses 51 through 69 I will not go because it's a lot of verses here. This is where Christ then teaches the doctrine that to come unto him, we must partake of him. We must eat of his flesh and drink of his blood. Meaning that we must enter into the covenant path through baptism, make covenants to serve him only, and to always remember him and to take upon us his name. Christ must become a part of us. He must become internalized and become a part of our heart, our soul, our spirit. Not just this thing we do on Sunday and we go and partake the desire and then I forget about it. No, we must partake of him and get Christ inside of us. And as you read those verses, chapter 6, verses 51 through 69, it's interesting that some, because of this doctrine, now left some of the disciples, not the apostles, but some of his disciples left because the doctrine was too hard. And Peter turns to the twelve and says, Will you go away? And Simon Peter answered and said, Lord, whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Brothers and sisters, may we be willing to accept also the hard doctrines. Maybe it goes against my social, political, or business views. But may we accept the hard doctrines, because only Christ is the one that has eternal life. Well, the third way to come into Christ and focus on Him is in John chapter 7, verse 17. Judge God's words properly and do it. Verse 17 says, If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Brothers and sisters, that is the pattern. That is the proper way it goes. You will not be given a testimony and then you live the law of tithing. You won't be given a testimony and then you live the word of wisdom. You won't live the, be given a testimony and then consecrate your things unto the Lord. No. You will first live the law of tithing, then you will come to know Christ and his doctrine. You will live the law of consecration and consecrate your life and your time and your means to the Lord. Then you will receive a witness, it is true. You first live the word of wisdom, then you relieve, get the spiritual blessings that are promised in that great process. And every doctrine is that way. That is the pattern. That is the order. We must first do, then we will come to know the doctrine. That is how we come unto Christ and focus on him by doing the works Christ asks us to do. Our focus must be on things of the Spirit. We must focus on our spiritual side, brothers and sisters. Listen to what Elder M. Russell Ballard said in the 1993 General Conference. The adversary is strong and cunning. However, you have within your physical body the powerful spirit of a son or daughter of God. Because he loves you and wants you to come unto, come home to him, our Father in heaven has given you a conscience that tells your spirit when you are keeping the Lord's commandments and when you are not. Now note this. If you will pay more attention to your spiritual self, which is eternal, than to your mortal self, which is temporary, you can always resist. You can always resist. Notice it didn't say sometimes. You can always resist the temptations of Satan and conquer his efforts to take you into his power. So there is the question, brothers and sisters. Are you and I focusing more on our temporal selves, the physical things of mortality, or do we focus more on the spiritual self, which is eternal? Where is my focus? Where do I spend more time? Now, he knows we have to make a living. We have to do all those things, and that's going to take a lot of our time. But do I take time to focus on the spiritual and to get the Spirit into my life, to be guided and directed by the Holy Ghost? 
to receive forgiveness of my sins, to be guided and directed by the Spirit and the Lord in all things? Am I taking the time to do those things necessary to bring the Spirit into my life, or am I too focused on the temporal? That will determine how well we can battle Satan in this battle down here. You and I will only win if we learn how to use the Holy Ghost and we learn how to follow the Spirit. That's why President Nelson said in the coming days, if you don't learn how to use the Spirit, if you do not get the Spirit, you will not survive. We can't survive without the Holy Ghost, brothers and sisters. The day we learn how to follow the Holy Ghost in all things and to be guided and directed by revelation through the Spirit is the day that Satan loses power over us. That I know to be true. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button and consider subscribing to my channel.